The year was 1923, and Coca-Cola was dominating the soft drink market. It had become an American household name, but its newly elected president, Robert Woodruff, had bigger plans. The global market. This is the story of how Coca-Cola took over Europe until it didn't, and how one man saved the entire European sector with his drink made from literal garbage. This is the story of Fanta. <laughs> Now, Coca-Cola had already been selling its products across the world, but its management was, well, less than ideal. But the company was given an opportunity. In 1928, the Summer Olympics was held in Amsterdam, the perfect international event that Coca-Cola could sponsor. People from all over the world saw the logo brandished on every building, sign, and billboard. Demand was finally growing internationally, and the drink had spread all over Europe where it eventually hit Germany. And during this heyday, they had sold over 100,000 cases a year. But its management was, well, less than ideal. And the German subsidiary was in financial disarray. And I'm sure nothing exciting happened later in 1933. Anyways, Coca-Cola's German branch was bleeding money in unpaid taxes and unopened bank statements, and this guy named Max Key, Max Kite, was having none of it. With the German economy booming, Kite saw an opportunity to remarket the idea of Coca-Cola as a drink fit for the hardworking people of the country. And with another Olympic set to be in Berlin, this was Kite's golden ticket. And it worked. Germany was loving Coca-Cola, now there was international management put in place to not bleed money all over the banks, and everything was going swell and dandy in Germany. Uh, hey, Woodruff, the entirety of Europe kind of declared war on Germany. Do you think we should be concerned? Keith, it's kind Whatever. America isn't involved. Hey, Keith, Max, Maxie boy. So our country kind of hates your country, and now we're officially at war, and, uh... With the Allied blockade preventing goods from entering Germany in World War II, Kite was stranded. But he would stop at nothing to keep the company afloat. So he needed to come up with a new drink fast. He gathered chemists to create a beverage that could be manufactured with domestic products. And well, in wartime, you get pretty desperate. So they mix fruit scraps from food industries and cheese whey, which if you don't know is, uh, well, it's cheese juice. A drink made from the scraps of the scraps, you would say. The mixture appeared light beige in color, similar to modern day ginger ale, and Kite told the team to explore their fantasies when coming up with the name. And right then and there, it clicked. Fanta. The drink was a smash hit. It wasn't just used for drinking, it was also used in cooking as a sweetener, and the flavor is a lot like modern Fanta today with a little less sweetness. Throughout the war, Fanta spread throughout Europe because, uh, well, Germany had a lot more factories, we'll say that. During this time, the drink had sold more than 3 million cases, and once the war was over, Kite handed all the profits back to the Coca-Cola company. Max Kite kept the business alive because of his determination, creativity, and his dedication to Coca-Cola. His co-workers described him as imposing and a natural-born leader. Although we never saw the man behind one of Coca-Cola's most popular drinks, his story will be one that will fascinate people for years to come. I'm done!